welcome to the 17th episode of season 4 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 11th of October 2011 and in this episode we are going to talk about Ubuntu 11.10 and the state of the Ubuntu community. We will of course cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, command line love and go over your feedback. I'm Tony and with me this week are Laura, Alan and Mark. Hello. So, hello. He- hello. Hello. So, Laura, what have you been up to recently? Uh, oh, I went to visit my parents and I inherited a new netbook. A new netbook? No, not a new netbook. I inherited a netbook that's new to me. Okay. So it's now running Natty. Ooh. Or it was running Natty anyway, but it now has fan silencer of some sort on it, so it's not too loud to use during the podcast. Is it that one there? It's this one here. That's the same as this one here. No, it's the same no. as Tony's one over there. Same oh, that one. Here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mine is a different one. Oh, yeah. lap- laptop twins. So, yes, and I found a pop-up book from the 80s about how the inside the of the 80s. personal computer, which I don't think Alan's seen yet. Oh, God. It's, it's really quite Is he going to jump Keep out? Keep quiet for hours. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. The primary colours. <gasps> wow. It's got 3D and everything. It's pop-up. <laughs> wow. It is pop-up. It's inside the personal computer. You don't even need those funny glasses. And there are even videos of it on YouTube I discovered today. Videos of a book? Of a book. Because wow. it's just lots of people of my age, presumably, are finding them. Does everyone say the book is better than the film? Yeah. <laughs> right, that's Alan busy for the next few minutes. <laughs> Mark, while Hello. he's playing with his toy, tell us what you've been about. Um, after last week's discussion, I've been sorting out my backups so that if I accidentally delete things again, I can get them back, which is nice. You reckon you can get them back? I, I can get How them back. Certain why, why are you sorting them out? What was wrong with them? I didn't have them. Well, I did have them, <laughs> but then they failed and then I didn't realise they'd failed until it was too late for me to do anything about it. Always basically. the way. So now I've got a fairly reliable and secure-ish system. <laughs> Your confidence I'm, is just I'm confident enough that I'm using it. Let's put it that way. Okay, that sounds good. But you were using your rubbish one before. It didn't work. Yeah, but this is much better than that one. Okay. <laughs> you see the confidence in him. <laughs> Alan, are you able to talk to us? Yeah. Good, good. I, I you were not. gesticulating frantically at us before that you weren't quite ready. No, 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 no. I don't know what you're talking about. So what have you been doing? I don't know. What have I been doing? Let me look at the document and see what I've been doing. Um, it says here. Uh, uh, what have I been doing? Etherwake. Ah, Etherwake. Yeah, I wanted to... Um, do the usual reduce power consumption at home. So shut down machines and then when I want to use one, wake it up and yeah. use it and then power it down again. And I had right trouble. I had no problems getting the Mac to do it. The, the uh, running Ubuntu. But um, before <laughs> you all jump on me, but my desktop PC the uh, wouldn't wouldn't wake and I was trying all kinds of, you know, Etherwake and I was making sure I got the right Mac address and all that kind of stuff. And it just wouldn't work. And I thought I'd got it enabled in the BIOS and I went looking for BIOS updates and this kind of stuff. And then someone pointed out there's a command called ftool that you can run on Linux. Oh, yeah. And ftool has an option that allows you to enable Wake on LAN to turn it on on the network card. And I didn't realize that it wasn't turned on in the network card, even though it was turned on in the BIOS. So I And that run, worked. I had to run this command to make it all enabled. And now I can wake my laptop up, my machine at home up from work, which is nice. Is that persistent across reboots? So I guess it must be, because it's, shu- it's shut down. Uh, <laughs> well, um, well, actually, I, sus- I woke it up from suspend, so not from shutdown. All right, okay. Is, mm. But yeah, that was good. Oh, and I've been learning Vi. Why? Hey! Sorry, VI, all right, before we get feedback <laughs> about that. Because um, I, I did learn it ages ago, but then I... <laughs> I really felt... Then you realise there are better ways for editors to work? Yeah, I've got a short, you know, short amount of time on this planet. Why should I, why should <laughs> I learn VI? Um, the thing is, right, I get... There's all the people who sit around me at work and they all use VI. Peer pressure. Um, so, yeah, there is a bit... <laughs> felt inadequate. No, I felt that when, they, when I go over to their machine, they go, oh, can you have a look at this? And I go over to their machine and they're in <laughs> VI... WQ. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I do. I quit and then start Nano (laughs) and edit the same file in Nano and I feel better and I can do it faster. But then I see them like with the keyboard shortcuts and stuff doing magical stuff and I think I should really just learn that. It's editor envy really, isn't it? It is a bit, yeah. A skill (laughs) skill set envy, you know, all kinds of things. So I've removed Nano from all my machines and on the one machine that I share with someone else who demanded that I put Nano back on the machine, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just aliased Nano to Vi on my machine. I'm sure he was chuffed by that. <laughs> no, just for my user. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I'm the only one who has to use Vi. I was taught that I had to learn the basics of Vi 
just because on some machines that's all you'll find. That's true. Yeah. That. Is it? It's not a problem I've come across very often, to be honest, in a desktop. No. But And every yeah. machine where that would be the case, I would have apt get. <laughs> just yeah. get another editor. What well, if you're trying to sort out your internet connection, you have to edit or, text files manually. Or app get. I have used kind of cut down distros where there's only via, I think, smooth wall or IP cop. Yeah, yeah I think that's what he's getting I, at. But the thing is, I can get by. I can open Vi. At the moment, my skill set is I can open Vi, um, insert, append, overwrite, and delete lines. Yep, that's what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I can go to the top and the bottom of a file. Oh, I can't do that. Uh, double G and big G. Okay. Yeah, those, those are the ones you need. But, any more than that, like delete a word or jump to the end of the line, I hold the cursor key down. <laughs> and then I get messed up when some versions of Vi don't use the cursor keys. You have to use J, K, and all that kind of stuff. Learn to play NetHack. Is that what helps, is it? Yeah, because the controls... Yeah. It, it's learning... Editing a file in Vi uses the same sort of paradigms that playing NetHack does. So, like, you... When in NetHack, if you want to attack something five times, you press five and then you press attack. And similarly in... <laughs> You Vi- don't have to go into attack mode first by pressing escape, colon, A. <laughs> Not quite. But no, similarly, in, in Vi or Vim, you, you, know, you want to delete five words, you say D, 5, W, and it deletes five words. So it's a similar sort of idea, and you have the same movement keys as well. I'm glad I didn't have to play a game to learn G-Edit. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, if you do that, you have enough spare time in you know, you- a social life, you can actually learn Vi... If you have enough spare time to play NetHack. If you use your spare time to play NetHack, yes. Yeah. Okay, right. I suppose we've been... Oh, and Tony, oh. what have you been doing? Uh, okay, I went to New York for my friend's <laughs> wedding and it was good. And cool. I took photographs and they were good. Cool. Excellent. And are you going to write a blog post that people are going to complain about? On yeah, I will, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do oh, no, you've sir. already done that. <laughs> yes. Right, let's get on with the show. <laughs> It's just two days till the release of Ubuntu 11.10. That's oneric. Let's talk oneric. about. Let's talk about oneric. it. Oh, okay. Nice Alice band. Yeah, Alan's hair <laughs> is special right now. <laughs> Thanks very much. Right. So, what's new in oneric ocelot? Oneric. Oneric. I think, I think it's oneric. Alan Bell's been having fun getting the um, the sound thing to say oneric properly, <laughs> audibly, and that's been quite hard. But apparently, it's oneric. Oneric. Yeah. Two more days, and then we haven't got to say the stupid name anymore. <laughs> we'll just say no. Well, and there's never ever going to be another stupid name that we have to say. Um, yeah. More on that later. <laughs> uh, well, so the first thing is, um, uh, eleven oh four was the first release where. We have the new Unity. It's not the first release with Unity, but it's the first one with the new Compass based Unity. Oh, right? yes. Yeah. And uh, now we've got another release with it, but it's more polished, works better. I'd like to say it crashes less. <laughs> <laughs> Buzz it. I'd like to. Right, okay. <laughs> but in my experience, that's not been the case. Right, okay. But I file bugs when it has, so, yeah, been a good boy. Yeah, well done. <laughs> and there's no more old gnome to fall back on anymore, is it? It's going away. Uh, when you say old gnome, we mean no, gnome, <laughs> gnome two. Two, two dot x the two panel style. Yeah, yeah so in eleven oh four, we can choose to log in as uh, Ubuntu classic, classic no. that's we, which it. is yeah. old gnome. Yes, so that's going. Yes, classic gnome is gone, and it's uh, Unity three D is the default. And if your machine's not capable of three D, or if it's uh, low spec, or if you just want to choose to, you can run Unity two D. What's the difference between three D and two D? One well, D. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Galloping over the hill. Got that that was... by a <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you finish first. Uh, uh, it, um, one of them requires uh, 3D accelerated hardware. So uh, that would be like an NVIDIA or an ATI card or a, a bog standard Intel card would probably do it. Is that the default? Yes. Even in Natty? Uh, yes. Ooh. So, how's the de- <laughs> and so you now know that your machine does 3D because you had Unity in Natty? Natty. Yes. And it was quite slow, or it is fairly slow at times. Can be, yeah. I, I find it, um, the, the the composited desktop in general annoys me because it slows me down. Um, some people will say, you know, you, you get uh, efficiency through, you know, shortcuts and, and nice things in the desktop that make it faster. You get used your... to working around the slowness. Yeah, or something. But I find, like, if I'm playing a game, you can tell the frame rate of the game is slowed down 
by uh, okay. the other three D stuff going on on the desktop. That that doesn't help. I might try the two D thing just to see if it's all right. Yeah, it is. It is all right. I mean, it's functionally very similar. Um, you have the same keyboard shortcuts. You have the same kind of view with the launcher on the left hand side. So it's not like it looks different. Okay, it looks pretty much identical. Um, you can tell the effects are different, you know, okay. no blurring and, and fading and stuff like that. But you can probably do without that because the whole point of Unity in some people's eyes is to get out of the way and get you to your applications mm. faster. So arguably, it doesn't matter if you're using 3D or 2D, you want it to go away so you can use your application. I suppose if it's running fast enough, it blurs so subtly that you get the effect without being disrupted. Whereas I guess on, say, this netbook, it's a bit slow. Yeah, yeah. And you've got the option of the GNOME 3 desktop in uh, yeah. with GNOME Shell, is that yes, right? Yes, you can. You can, you can add, use GNOME Shell. Yeah, you can install it. Doesn't, it's not on the CD by default. Yeah. And um, Is it in the official repositories or is yes. it in the... Right, okay. So with 11.04, you had to add it on a PP, with a PPA. Yeah. And because 11.04 was based on GNOME 2 and GNOME Shell is based on GNOME 3, it was a real bit of work yeah. to get it to work <laughs> on 11.04 and it would break stuff mm. and there was all these warnings saying don't put this on your machine you will break it and then people put it on broke it and, and so, then oh, complained yeah. yeah so now so you can actually install it from the repository and it works so i suppose if you've got uh, a 3d accelerated desktop you all right for gnome shell and you're all right for unity 3d yes, yes. and and kde if you want. Oh, yeah, that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mark, what's new in KDE in 1110? Um, I right, think it's... moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Is it more blue? Uh, I think it might be a bit less blue. I don't okay. know. Oh. Interesting about colours, actually. Moving back to Unity. Um, when you open the dash, which is the big box where you type, where you search for stuff, it has a like a transparency effect oh, and, yeah. and the background color changes depending upon what color you've got on your desktop. Mm. So the predominant color of whatever photo or picture you've got. And it actually really makes quite a nice difference that you don't have, it's not always orange. It's, oh, it's right. whatever right. color is the mm. predominant color of your desktop already. It's quite nice. There's a new login screen as well. Light DM. So, so this is replacing GDM, the GNOME desktop manager. No, sorry, GNOME display manager, which yes. was the old login screen. Yes. And this is light DM. Presumably it's faster. Uh, is it lighter? <laughs> Shiny? I don't know. Does it I, let you, you know? know, you see it, you type your password, you press enter. <laughs> I have to what say. What more is yeah. there to do? Does it support uh, ICC colour profiles in the login screen? I have no, no. idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Can you put a pointless picture of a flower there by your name just to show that it's you? I don't think it does pictures, actually. Oh, I have right. a feeling you don't get the avatars. But I know there was a... The guy who develops it, I think, works for Canonical, and he put a video on um, on YouTube a uh, month or so back that was like a prototype of something you could do with Light DM, and it had these three-dimensional modelled people walking around with a little name... Um, tag above their like head. a Wii, uh, yeah, like like the, the thing Wii. on the me, yeah. you know the the yeah, yeah. And um, people walking around, and you click on your person, your little avatar, and that's you. And it was just like illustrating, you know, you wouldn't want to do that. And all the comments were like, "Why would you do this?" That's and, quite uh, cute. Yeah, it is. Yeah, for three or four people, a family or whatever who share yeah. a computer, that's yeah. fine. We we'll tried doing it in a ten thousand seat. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? No, get out of the way. <laughs> Move. Yeah, that would be weird. Mm. <laughs> Nice to see new developments in that sort of area, though. Yeah. Um, and there's some new sort of updated packages. Uh, LibreOffice is landing version 3.4.3. Yeah, this is all at the end of the list, the kind of, yeah, yeah, loads of updated stuff, which is all the stuff from upstream that makes Ubuntu what it is, of mm. course. But. And Firefox, Firefox 7, and hopefully Firefox. a new version of Chrome or Chromium as well. Um, well, I get Chromium yeah, from upstream. You always, don't, Chrome. Isn't there all... Chrome, sorry, isn't Chromium always updating itself? Chrome is. Chromium oh, really? does not. I didn't know that. Because Chrome is updated by Google, but Chromium is the repackaged, fully open source right. version when it's dependent on the uh, distributor to do it. So when I log into WordPress now, it says, your browser is out of date on my uh, Ubuntu laptop. Because it thinks it's Chrome. Because it thinks it's an old version of Chrome. Right. And it probably is out of date. I should really look into that. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a problem. I just thought it was a silly message. Um, yeah, and Linux 3.0, so the kernel's taken the bump to the 3.0 uh, version number. Yeah, and they've also t backported, as they usually do, some stuff from a later, so it's like 3.0.15 like or something, whatever. The really, they've backported some of that in as well, because there was some 
driver updates and fixes. So it's not it's not vanilla three point as usual. Just to go back on the uh, the Firefox thing. Now that Firefox are doing a release every other other day, um, <laughs> is Ubuntu going to be backporting those into? the current release, the support, a, support, a supported release. Well, because if you've got, say, uh, version 7 in in 11.10 as the, re- as the released version, six weeks down the line, it's out of date, there's a new version, and security fixes are only going in the latest version for a Firefox. Oh, so right. are they going to be ringing down 8 and 9 and 10 and up to 15 over the next I'm not sure what, what they're going to do about that in the main repository. I know there is a Mozilla team at PPA which is a team within Canonical yeah. who repackage oh, that's, stuff. Ah, oh, there's a team within Canonical. I thought it was a team within Mozilla who were packaging for Ubuntu. Well, they might be part of the yeah. Mozilla project. Right, I, don't okay. I don't know exactly who staffs thing. it. Yeah. But one of the guys um, has has been doing a lot of that work, Chris Coulson, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so when 7 came out, and it was pretty much instantly yeah, in 11.10. Updates since version 5, I've had updates coming in every, well, you know, almost on release day. Right. And Firefox saying, you need to restart me now. Thanks <laughs> for that. Just like Windows. <laughs> well, 11.04 didn't have Firefox 7. It had an older release. Mm. So they put Firefox 7 in that PPA. So if you're still on 11.04, you can still get the updated yeah. with this Mozilla team PPA. Okay. Let's talk email clients. <laughs> People still use email clients? Yeah, it's the web browser, isn't, no, it? Yes. Clients, isn't it, these days? Chrome. <laughs> is my, Chrome is my email client. Thunderbird. So Thunderbird yeah. has replaced Evolution. Evolution has been the default email client in Ubuntu since... Forever. It was a twinkle in Mr. Shuttleworth's eye, mm. and it's always been a source of slight controversy because it's been a slightly heavyweight and some points unreliable email client, but it has <laughs> it has features that uh, other alternatives haven't, like Thunderbird, such as a full calendaring thing. It's been integrated with the Gnome desktop, all that sort of stuff. It used to have synchronization with um, Palm Pilots as well. And uh, Exchange. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's the one reason I'd use Evolution, is to get my university email, which is um, Outlook, and I have to use the NAF web client, only the server's apparently not new enough for uh, evolution to recognize it oh dear mm. yeah i use it at work for novel group wise as well yeah thunderbird has been um touted and argued for at pretty much every uds for you know since the first yes. release <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um yeah Never i remember it look any nicer <laughs> well it does look pretty nice from thunderbird 3 upwards i think it looks oh, okay. pretty much better it's yeah. been a while pretty good yeah. it still does that very slow indexing thing where it tries to download every ma- mail you've either received sent or deleted <laughs> and indexes them for search functionality but once That's it gets good, isn't it? it is good but it slow. slows the system right down particularly uh, in my case i've got a remote imap server so it pulls them all down indexes yeah. them locally and you end up with a massive kind of cache of those does of those it just not do that once when you very first set up the account or does it do that for all your mail every time uh, every time you set up Thunderbird. Okay. So if you set up on a new machine, so it's once on, per PC. Once per PC. That's not so bad. It's not so bad. They, they the had a day. panel of the preview bar. It's massive. It takes up a lot of space. It doesn't work very well on netbook size screens. I oh, think. it's no. quite vertically. Yeah. Um, there are quite a few different <laughs> options for the, the headers. I can't find the word. Vertically obese. Spacious. Vertically obese. I don't know. Spacious. Tall. <laughs> Perhaps. Tall. Yeah. Capacious. Yes, I think. Vertically capacious. But I think it's. I'm, I think I'm pleased in general that it's yes. replaced Evolution. Yes. Which is quite good. Yeah, like so am I, despite never using an email client. Font news. What's <laughs> happening in the uh, the land of monospace fonts? The monospace font is in. Ooh. Hooray. Um, in terminal. Cool. Is it done? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. In ter- in, uh, so if you open a Ubuntu terminal... A gnome terminal, sorry. Um, you'll you'll see the monospace font, and it looks lovely. Mm-hmm. But if you try and set it in the console, so Control Alt F one, uh, oh, right. it's, oh, yeah. it's not the default there. The con- oh right, yeah, yeah, in oh. the in the, uh, oh, yeah. the actual real console, yeah, or on a server. If you're directly attached to a server, it's not the default there. Um, and part of the reason is it looks horrid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a much lower resolution on the on the, the actual console, isn't it? Yes. Actually, I thought they'd a few more recent versions. When I switched to the console, it goes in a nice little sort of the same size font I'd have in an, uh, a terminal window. Yeah, they use kernel mode switching to get you a nice yeah. graphical um, display in the console. Hmm. But the specific problem is the, the font looks oh, rubbish in that ah. in that screen. Right. I don't know it's whether it's the conversion to the format for fonts in that size or something, but I spoke to Sladen about it because he's kind of looking at it. Could be a lack things. of um, anti-aliasing or hinting or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it's not the default, because it looks right. rubbish. Right, good. <laughs> but it looks great everywhere else. Cool. 
And Ubuntu One has a new user interface. Yeah, it's very orange. Oh. <laughs> is it very different other than Hold being on. orange? Uh, well, it's a bit bigger and, you know, it's a bit more, you know, Harry Big Buttons. What <laughs> user yeah. interface does Ubuntu One need? Isn't it supposed There's to a, a be client. out of the way? You know, the, the sign-up thing where you manage your um, subscriptions to folders and stuff. Oh, of course, yeah. 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 Thing. yeah. Um, and choose whether you want certain folders um, synchronized or yes, not. Yes, okay. Kind of you can tell I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> and it look, it's um, it's got parity with the Windows version as well. We, uh, we mentioned the, the Windows same. version last time. Yeah, they oh, look, yeah we they did. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's quite good. Yeah. Okay, George Castro in the hash Ubuntu-UK-podcast IRC channel on Freenode Uh-oh. tells me that Chromium is updated, but it's just behind, oh, okay. the, uh, behind the times a bit. Cool. Um, yeah, it says uh, in our notes here, multi-arch. Yes. Is this ARM and stuff? No. No. No, no it's... No. It's, uh, it's, it's like McDonald's. Um, you know we have 32-bit... A version and a 64-bit version of Ubuntu. Yep. And one of the problems is if you install the 64-bit version and you want to run 32-bit applications, say, for example, oh. a proprietary application like Flash or Skype or something else, mm-hmm. you, there's this horrible bunch of libraries that get pulled in yeah. in order to kind of emulate that 32-bit environment to make that work. And it's a bit horrid and it, it's a bit buggy. So Debian and Ubuntu are both now, um, as of Natty, I think the tools are capable of being multi-arch, which means you can go, if you're sat on a 64-bit machine, you can go apt-get install package name colon i386, uh-huh. and it'll install the 386 version on your 64-bit system and run that. Does that mean if I download a .deb that's just 386, I can install that as well? I think so, yeah. Cool, because the Amazon MP3 downloader is... Uh, three, it's right, only. yes. So if you install that, that probably has some dependencies, and that... Those dependencies, if you when you do the apt get install bit, you'll see them listed in the apt get install with colon i three eight six after them. Oh, uh, okay, because cool. it figures out that they're three eight six libraries, and it's not just Intel stuff. Other chips like PowerPC, if we had a PowerPC, oh right, they have okay. thirty two bit and sixty four, and so does MIPS, and so multi arch is not an Intel thing; it's a thirty two versus sixty four bit. Okay, thing. and that applies across different chipset families, yes. and it applies more to Debian than us because they are available on lots of different architectures. Okay, well, why not send us in your feedback about what your favourite feature in 11.10 is? It should be out by the time you send us an email. Uh, <laughs> send it to... <laughs> quick, send please. One now. Send one now, quick. Maybe they'll release early. Send it to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. It's time for the news... The Blender Foundation has launched Project Mango, the next project to create a short animated film to show off its Blender software capabilities as a professional 3D animation tool. The theme of the project is sci-fi in Amsterdam. That could go one that of very like a... many ways. <laughs> you say that and I immediately think of Zalior. Hmm. I was thinking of the cantina in uh, Star Wars. Wars. Star Wars. I nearly said Star Trek then and that would have got us a lot of feedback. Geek credits. <laughs> Blogger, free software guy and former Free Software Foundation member Larry Cafiero has called for the foundation to be forked and a new organisation founded that is a more flexible and more responsible organisation that marries today's technological realities to the possibilities and necessities. After further discussion of the issue, he has concluded this change of leadership is the most important factor to bring the FSF back to relevance. So what triggered this then? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It was something Richard Stallman said oh, about it, right. Steve Jobs being, or Richard Stallman quoting <laughs> someone else. Oh, was right. it? Uh, you know, something along the lines of, um, I'm not I'm, glad, I'm he's, not dead, glad he's dead, but I'm glad he's gone. That's got to put Richard Stallman in a bit of a bind, isn't it? Because it's somebody enforcing their right to fork versus him taking away <laughs> from the Free Software Foundation. <laughs> Talk about a conflict of interests. The Time Zone Database, a project providing free time zone data used in Java and Unix-like systems, among others, is under attack from Astrolabe, a company who recently purchased ACS Atlas, from which some of the database may be derived. While Arthur David Olson and Paul Eggert, who maintain the database, are currently facing personal lawsuits, the database continues to be maintained by the community. Well, that's... Mm. I mean, that's bad, obviously, someone going after them... Some are they their um, astrology? Yeah, company? yeah. They're not even like proper scientists. No, they're not even proper people. <laughs> yeah. Losers. Their website is rubbish. It is. It looks like GeoCities, doesn't yes. it? Yes, <laughs> it's properly rubbish. Front page express. Yes. Um, well, we'll have to hope that 
they sort out yeah. their legal issues but as always the community works around the problem yeah hopefully the community will support them with their lawsuit as well yeah fund mm. lawyers Kerry Facer of Manchester Metropolitan University, interesting spelling of Metropolitan we have there, has written a blog <laughs> post you, just re- for you. requesting input into what could become a new BBC micro project, a project run by the BBC to promote interest and understanding in the areas of computing and computational thinking. Cool. This is good, isn't it? Because when we, it's a good idea. Yeah. When I was at school, that's when the BBC first came out. The BBC Micro okay. being a beige computer. Yeah, that was really. We awesome. had one of them. They were still around when I was at school. But uh, okay. Mark, when I was at school, we learnt how to import a CSV file into Microsoft Access. It's fast See, and it's gone downhill since then. Kids, at my my kids at school, okay, they play games, educational software, but I know the older kids. It's how to use Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Yeah. It's yeah. it's not proper analytical skills. We learnt how to draw lines to make a square using basic. Ah. Oh. Not That's probably cool. the most not useful logo. thing. No, no, it wasn't. A, it was. I'm not sure. It was some kind of IT class. Actually, yeah. it reflects on what the uh, CEO of Google was saying the other yeah. the other yes. other week, wasn't it? About uh, British school children needing to be to learn computer science rather than ICT. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. couldn't agree more. Alan, yes, me. Fans of one-handed surfing may be frustrated to learn that the government is planning to introduce porn filters. Customers will have to opt in to access Smart Online and the current propo- if the current proposals go ahead. Sorry, I got a bit flustered. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wave of panic. Oh, dear. Laura spotted a flaw with this. What? Oh, um, because it's whole household. So if you've got children and you want to stop children accessing anything questionable, I guess, then the whole household suffers. Well, yeah, okay, so there's a few things. One is, this is only for new accounts. So, okay. and, and it's only so far for the four big um, ISPs. Uh, BT, Talk, Talk Virgin, Virgin, and... Other. Another one. <laughs> another one. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> that's what that is. Um, and even if you are affected by it, you can opt out. Oh, yeah. Sky. Uh, that's the fourth one, is it? Yeah. Uh, so you can opt out Not and then implement your own measures. Yeah. Which oh, is yeah. which is what I've done. I've got, you know, parental controls on the PC. Um and other people I know use open DNS for this kind of stuff. But it is the thin end of the wedge. It is yeah. implementing Exactly. It's it's restrictions not, on what you can see on a not connection. It's the government's job to mandate this, is it? No. It's if you've got kids, it's your job to make sure that you know, they're not growing up warped and <laughs> Probably is. mentally help. horrified. I think the problem is there are some parents out there who have no clue and they'll put a PC yeah. in their kid's bedroom from the age of four and not realise that, that that's an open gateway to, okay, free inf- free access to lots of very useful and informative information, which may be very good for their upbringing, but equally some pretty nasty stuff they shouldn't be seeing. And this or, is why you need better computing education in schools. Exactly. Ooh, full you. circle. And we have some events. The Ubuntu release party is happening in London this Thursday at the Cask from 6.30pm. Do not go at <laughs> a.m. That's the Ubuntu UK release party. Yes, there are other release parties. And there's others in the UK. I think there's one in Leeds, maybe one in Lott- Nottingham as well. Brilliant. But the London one's um, a big one. Yeah, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of people going. Yeah, there's a load of... Um, I think Jono's flown over from America just to come and buy me a drink. Am, am I right in saying that he said he was going to pay for the drinks for the evening? Yes, he did. Yeah, yes, he from, said exactly that. <laughs> from, all, from all the heavy money he's making from Severed Fifth, I yes. think. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a new paradigm in music. Yeah. London Install Fest is happening on the 16th of October, which is about a, four or five days away. Yeah, the weekend. Yeah, so John Stevenson has rever- reserved an area in the Shooting Star, which is in Middlesex Street in London, um, on Sunday 16th. Doors open around 12 noon. They have Wi-Fi, and they're not that busy on a Sunday. So uh, you can go along there and install Ubuntu or help other people install Ubuntu. Yeah, sounds good. The weekend immediately after the release, there'll be... Uh, people eager to install them to upgrade or um, yeah. fix problems that they've done by installing or upgrading. <laughs> and it's in a pub. That too, yes. And getting away from the London-centric events, we've got breaking news of FOSDEM, which will be in Brussels. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, it's exasperating Tony there. <laughs> On the 5th and 6th of February. No, 
now it's time for some command line love. <laughs> and Andrew McCarthy um, tweeted us with a command called Eat My Data. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> Which apparently is a command for running another command, but disabling disk syncing, which makes things happen quicker, but might lose your data if the power goes or something. So only run this if you really know what you're doing. Yeah, if you've got a UPS and you need to do a big... I don't think it's that much of a problem, really. It's it's a specific... So, so the problem this is trying to solve is programs are sometimes slow because they're constantly telling... The kernel, you need to flush this to disk. Oh, panic, panic, flush this to disk, flush this to disk. When you don't really need to do that because the power isn't that unstable. Oh, yeah. And the chances that your machine's going to go fut right at the point when you saved that valuable so was know, that tweet, fut? tweet, fut, P H T, at that point um, is quite slim. And the suggestion he gave is, um, as an example, is Liferia, if that's how you pronounce it. Yep, uh, the Liferia. Is it? Is it <laughs> Liferia? I don't know. I don't think so. Liferia. Your advice on how to pronounce something. Liferia? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, it's an RSS reader. So, you know, what's the worst that could happen if your RSS reader didn't save the status of red RSS items? You have to read them again. Oh, no, disaster. Yeah. So by disabling these rights, or at least delaying them until they absolutely have to be done, mm. um, you get a bit a better, better disc IO yeah, yeah. performance. Even better output performance. I wonder if Massively. it would... Uh, uh, well, I I didn't get a chance to test it because we only got this uh, minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> That's how organised we yeah, are. Yeah, breaking news. Uh, <laughs> in a form Breaking of your systems. <laughs> um, but yes, if listeners would like to let us know uh, how, how, it goes. how much data they lost with data, <laughs> then don't blame us. <laughs> yes, don't email us. Email Andrew McCarthy. Here's hoping it does what it says on the tin. So John O. Bacon wrote a blog post a few days ago, um, which came from a discussion at a recent community council meeting that happened last week, um, where there was some debate about the state of the community and uh, sort of people's motivation, both in terms of the members and leaders and people who might become leaders in the future. Yes. Yes. So Ubuntu has been around for uh, how many years now? Since 2004. And over that time, Ubuntu has grown. Uh, Canonical, the company behind it, has grown to like four, five hundred employees now. Number of users has grown exponentially. Well, probably not exponentially. It's grown quite well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm merely spe- I'm speculating. Um, and um, we've put in place uh, uh, councils, boards, uh, leadership teams in order to um, manage that community of contributors and developers yeah. and uh, and help users get to the right place in the community mm-hmm. um and it strikes me that actually um people are people's interest is waning a bit um and I, i'm i'm not what, sure why what how have you noticed that how does it manifest itself well there's there's the obvious ones where people blog about how they're leaving ubuntu to go and use mint or to go to debian or or and that might be because they don't trust canonical it could be that they don't like unity uh it could be they want to contribute upstream or for whatever reason you know people leave the project but i think that's not the main part i think it's more there are people who are contributors and how long-term contributors people who've been in the project for maybe four five or even six years and i think they may have had enough <laughs> or but he may maybe finding it hard to find the motivation to carry on. It is literally the seven year itch, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it is, <laughs> yeah. But even the uh, uh in, in the first two or three years of, of Ubuntu there were some fairly significant people who were involved in setting up the project who who moved on. Um Yeah, you're always going to get uh, staff turnover within Canonical, you're always going to get people whose motivations change. Uh, people who who who've, um, personal circumstances change. Lives change. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and I don't think we should 
strive to keep everyone because you don't want to keep unhappy contributors and you don't want to try and force people to contribute to your project. But equally, the people who want to contribute or who have a feeling that they might like to contribute, it should be a place that they can um, contribute and feel happy about what they're doing. Is it something where on paper it looks like there's there's a lot being done and a lot happening over the various open weeks that are going on, um, the various sort of community events, things like the buttons uh, competition <laughs> and the artwork and and various other things that people not those can... buttons. Not, oh, okay, oh, right. sorry. No, it, sorry. When not... Tony mentions buttons, he has that look in his eye, and I think he's only he's remembering <laughs> the moment. Yeah. I meant the the, uh, the Ubuntu release countdown ah, uh, yes. uh, mm. buttons on the website and things, and various other sort of you know projects and things that people can get involved in, mm. but. Perhaps it's just the same old faces doing it, and a few of those are going. It is and a lot not of being that. replaced. It is some of that. You know, there are the same people. We obviously welcome new contributors, and we would love it when someone who first starts out as a user of Ubuntu and then turns into a developer or turns into a community contributor and maybe gives a talk about something or gives a session at an open week or a developer week or uh, runs um, an Ubuntu hour or like uh, John Stevenson we mentioned in the events takes it upon himself to hire a room in a pub and and help yeah. people out but yes there I think you're right there is an element that there are a number of people who are long-term contributors who've yeah just had enough. Do you think new people are possibly intimidated by the fact that it seems to be the same people involved and therefore it seems harder to get in to be part of it yeah i think there is a part of that and there's also a part of um the barrier to entry might be a bit higher than than you would expect and higher than it was four years ago in what way um if you want to be let's say for example if you want to um contribute you see people chatting away on irc giving support and you want to you want to help out there are already a whole bunch of people helping out in there yeah the and they already know all of the common frequently asked questions and they often get in there before you do um and so you might be really super keen and eager to help but it's difficult to do it because there's so many other people who are for want of a better word better at it than you yeah. because they've been doing it for so long and they've got so much experience or just more confident Dovin. Yeah, that too. And also, sometimes you get smacked down by the people who've been doing it a long time. You know, by you know the neckbeard syndrome. We've been here for ages and we've been yeah. doing it. We know how to do it and you're wrong. And and I've seen situations of that that happening, not just on IRC. I'm, you know, in, uh, that, that was an example, but there are, you know, in general, it can happen as well. You know, someone joins the art team and says, hey, I've made this logo. Nobody replies. Or one person replies and goes, don't like it. You know, it, it's 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 hard to get over that barrier there are conversely there are some places where it is super easy to contribute like ask ubuntu yeah <laughs> log to ask ubuntu you get you know get an account for nothing filter show all questions that have got no answers pick one answer it you know there, there are some ways that are super easy to contribute so if you look at the community leaders and things like the community council is a good place to find that sort of person i think i'm, I'm right in saying in the past the uh, elections for the community council have been sort of oversubscribed. There have been lots of people who uh, have wanted to stand and perhaps more people than could effectively be voted for. Yes. Whereas this time around, we've had quite a few people stepping down and not wanting to stand for re-election, not choosing to for, for whatever reason. Yeah. And it seems to be... Uh, and a less small, people have stood. Uh, less interest, yeah. That's what less I'm getting new at. people have stood as well. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. Like the, when I stood two years ago... The voting form for, you know, who you want to vote for um, in the community council election was pretty long. And that and now it's it's a lot shorter. I think there's something like seven, seven names or ten, no, it's 11 it's for seven. 11, I think, yeah. 11 names for seven positions. Um, so basically, you know, you've got to be doing really badly not to be within a good chance of getting elected. <laughs> That's what, Well, yes, but... The list of candidates isn't just people who nominated themselves. The nominees for community council, okay, this is very specific, but the way the process works is you nominate yourself or someone nominates you to be elected onto the community council. That goes to the current community council and Mark actually gets the veto. He says, this is the shortlist. Now, last time, I think a few people were knocked off and it was the community council that decided who was knocked off that list and Mark got the final say. This time... Mark just said they're all good. Right. So nobody got knocked off. Nobody got 
didn't get through that first round of nomination to get to the vote. Okay. okay. So that's that's one specific technicality of the community council. But you've got to remember the community council, the pool of people you're pulling from are people who are already leaders in Ubuntu. Yeah. So the people who are already on the IRC council, already a leader within their loco, already a leader somewhere else. And what I'm talking about is not a problem at that level. Okay. I'm talking about a problem much further down the chain, okay. which is getting people into leadership positions in their local community and their loco and whatever other teams. And and not just leaders, but uh, contributors who will then become leaders. I don't think we're fostering new people to become leaders in the community. Okay. My experience of LUGS and my experience of the Ubuntu UK loco is that generally there aren't a huge number of people who want to be leaders for that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, elections are generally uncontested, or maybe there's two people who, who want to do it out of a group of, say, 100 plus people. So why is it then difficult to find, to get people into those positions if there is such a relatively small amount of people who are willing to do it in the first place? Why is it hard if there aren't many people? Surely yes, that's, because that's answering it, your question, isn't it? Well, no, because you only need one to be a leader. Well, yeah, but the, the, the project is growing and we have new teams starting up to do different things. Okay, there's there's only one team in the UK uh, for UK Loco, but it could quite easily happen. I mean, that team has got 500, 700 people in it. It could quite easily be that they say, well, that's too big. Let's break it up a bit and let's let's turn it into the, the lug model where you, you break it down by a smaller region, whether that's north, south, east and west or state or county or whatever you want to do. You've still got to find some people who have the skills to lead in those areas. And it's right. getting more fragmented and there could be the people who would have been running the lugs or people running the lugs could have been running the locals. Yeah. And and you're right. The, the community is, whilst it's huge and there's loads of people in it, it's not, it, it's, it's a lot of people who are quite happy to be told what to do. Laura Tchaikovsky has just said in the IRC channel that some local teams apparently have councils and even community managers, yep. um, presumably yep. all volunteers, yep. uh, which she finds a bit baffling. But I can see why it'd be useful for a large loco. But mm. also, it's, they don't. Well, they're they're apparently able to find people to fulfil those roles. I, th- I think it, that there's a very. Um, I've had these discussions with Laura before. There's a there's a a very diverse culture across locos and in some locos like brazil they have actually got multiple teams within the brazilian team it's a massive country mm-hmm. yes a lot that's of people, that's part yes. of it but equally you look at the the flip side of the uk we're a pretty chilled out country in terms of you know open sourcey stuff okay people get a bit ranty you know <laughs> top posting um <laughs> but but in terms of, you know, we're, we're happy to let someone, you know, take control of the team and, and go and do their stuff. We we don't feel regimented and that we have to have a committee and we have to have this and that structure in place for something which is like five or six hundred people. Whereas I, I think there's a cultural difference where in other countries they do feel. And it's also about the personalities. Individuals sometimes feel that they need the support of a council or in order to get a vote of you know, shall we do this event or shall we focus on something else or do promotion? And they would like to have consensus and agreement rather than having one person dictate what should be done, if that makes sense. Do you think the size could be put, could put some people off? Obviously, it wouldn't put all people, all people off, but it's less cosy and it's more structured now than it probably was six years ago. Yeah. Uh, and and With the councils and things yeah and that, and that is certainly intimidating for for some new users and maybe we're making like i said earlier the the barrier to entry too too high yeah. for new people we try and keep it low and we try and say you know everyone's welcome and you know and i i sit in irc channels and on mailing lists and i see new people arrive and i there are names that i don't recognize and they're giving help and they're offering support and and stuff and i think that's great and these people may further you know in three years time when i'm sitting in my rocking chair and <laughs> retired and and slippers. yeah um then they'll be leading the team and that'd be great but yeah but I don't think we're fostering that. I think I don't think we're doing the right thing to make more people want to do that, that. and more people want to go through the, for want of a better word, ranks I, of Ubuntu. I think just as as a sort of general member of the community and nothing more, I think I do agree with that. I don't feel at the moment like I, you know, I don't feel the drive to become an Ubuntu member to, you know, start joining one of the teams and contributing. I'm quite happy just using it and it's knowing quite, that there's there's you know 
there's other people there doing the hard work for me. <laughs> Don't take this the wrong way, but it's part of that because you use Kubuntu. Um, <laughs> it could be, but I suppose, I mean, I'm still involved. I go in the Kubuntu IRC channel, I give support. But yeah, I, I mean, I could still become involved in the Kubuntu side of it, yeah. but I don't feel the need to. I don't feel like there's much that I need to do or that I would enjoy doing at the moment. Whereas Which is I, interesting because you are someone who has an immense amount of skill hmm. that, that <laughs> yeah. could be, I'm not trying to lay guilt trip on you, but I'm, I'm giving you, I'm putting you forward as an illustration of the kind of person who could do lots of really great things in the Ubuntu community, but self selects them out. Well, the, yeah. I mean, a few years ago, I think had I had the time to, I might have been more interested in doing it, but it's sort of the atmosphere. I, I think you're right that the atmosphere has changed recently around like the community and it doesn't feel like something which I want to, you know, push myself into at the moment. Whereas in the past That's it might have been, it was more, it felt more exciting before. Whereas at the moment it just feels like, you know. Is that because we've, we've reached that point? We haven't, we haven't, um, well, as Mark calls, like, leapt over the chasm and got, you know, Joe normal user, um, or all of the Joe normal users using it. <laughs> but we've got to that point where it's, 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 it's the place where lugs were a little while ago, where lugs started to wane because people didn't actually have that much trouble installing Linux. Yeah. And now Ubuntu's yeah, yeah. got people, to the point. People know what Ubuntu is. You yeah, know, you can say Ubuntu to someone and they won't look at you like you've just said something in Afrikaans. Well, many many people will, but well, yeah, yeah, we've got but, we've got, mean, certainly got a certain yeah. um, uh, I don't know. There's a certain chance that they might have heard of it, even if they don't really yeah. know what it yes, is. Exactly, that's what that's what I'm trying. But to say. then that advocacy is only one part of you know what, what we do. Mm. You know, there's there's plenty of other things. So, what can Ubuntu do to be fostering? The future leaders. Well, it's interesting you ask. Um, Jono sent out this survey to all Ubuntu members, um, and um, I believe he's processing the results. And that will be difficult this week because uh, it's release week. So sure. he and everyone else at Canonical is madly busy. So I would expect within the next week or two for Jono to summarise some of that in a blog post and and tell us what other people think of mm. you know how they can uh, how we can improve this. I'm sure there'll be state. a lot of discussion about it at UDS as well in the community track. I hope so, yeah. Um but you know do you do you think Ubuntu should be having some sort of perhaps informal program to spot people who could be useful in the long term to the Ubuntu project and, and communicate? Well, actually Amber Grainer has has kicked off a, a new team uh which is all about um developing leaders. Because people aren't oh, necessarily cool. naturally naturally leaders, or they might be, but, but they don't you need, want to put themselves forward. Exactly. Or, yeah. So Amber's set up a new leadership team. We'll put a link in the show notes um, to help people and foster people towards that leadership if they want it. And that's certainly a part of it. Um, I don't know if that's the whole solution. Okay. Well, if you have perceived any uh, changes in the Ubuntu community over the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. Keep counting. Yeah, I can do it. I'll take my shoes and socks off in a minute. Um, then one email in to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or get in touch with us via any of the other methods that we'll mention at the end of the show. Now it's time for a bit more about Ubuntu. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we did that. Uh, so Mark Shuttleworth has announced that Ubuntu 12 or, or 4 LTS will be called the Precise Pangolin. What precisely is a pangolin? It's an armoured anteater. Okay. Of. Right. Have we not had some kind of anteater before? We've had a warthog. Uh, mm. What was... <laughs> That's not some kind of anteater. No. Fair enough. Okay. I thought there was something. We had an ar- I felt so. I was say like Aardvark, but that that was wrong. No. Okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Do herons eat ants? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> um so it's not just us though that uh that have the um odd names. Oh yeah. Fedora have just announced that Fedora seventeen is gonna be the beefy miracle. They actually gone with it, haven't yes. they? Yes. <laughs> cool. And the, the, because of their naming convention, unlike Ubuntu's naming convention, which is Mark chooses it, <laughs> with, with Fedora, it's um, you have to have a, some kind of link between the next release code name and the previous release <gasps> code name. And the last one, I can't remember what the last one was, but the, the tenuous link they gave the beefy miracle to the previous one was 
the beefy miracle and the other one were candidates for the previous release name <laughs> <laughs> which is somewhat meta but oh right okay yes i thought that's quite good yeah tenuous to say the link <laughs> the, the least i think yeah just a bit Colin Watson has posted a summary of the top 10 Ubuntu brainstorm ideas and the responses to them. Yeah, it's an interesting write-up of some of these ones. Yeah, it's been a programme over the last year or two, I think. I think uh, Matt Zimmerman kicked it off um, to try and get uh, more feedback because we have this thing called brainstorm. I think we mentioned it way back on the very first show. Pretty much, yeah. I think it was the first show we we, we thought about maybe having a, a segment where we talk about the best brainstorm things. I think we just talked about it once yeah, um, and never looked at it again. Um, Four years later. Well, a lot of people find a way to, you know, tell us what they think we should do with Ubuntu. There's a nice one in here about adjusting the volume for your headphones automatically when you plug them in. So if you need the volume on your headphones lower than you do for your internal speakers, when you plug things in, they should automatically adjust. Yeah. And apparently it does actually work in 11.10 for some people see that's that's what's good is sometimes the answer is actually we've already done that mm. yeah yeah it's really cool to see like these ideas not just sitting there you know someone says oh this would be brilliant and then it just sits on a website is actually seeing the the responses and things coming out of them mm. yeah if you focus on just what the faults are all the time you're just going to end up with something that works but isn't particularly amazing or some of these things could really make a difference to people mm. Okay, community ne'er do well Alan Pope has oh. blogged about the Ubuntu Community Council elections. Eleven candidates are standing for a seven available seats, and Ubuntu members should be receiving emails with details about voting soon. Uh, it's already gone out. I it think. has. Yeah, I've had mine. I voted. Yes, yeah, so did I. It's a really complicated voting system, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and the fact that you go to the web page and you can either click and drag people, or you can use up, down, left, right arrows, or you can use drop down numbers. I think they're going Fully for accessible. maximum accessibility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what did you do? Did you press the buttons up and down or did you drag people? Uh, I <laughs> Combination of... No, I did the drop downs. Uh, I felt a sense of satisfaction grabbing someone and dragging them to the, <laughs> to the bottom of the list. Right. I won't <laughs> ask who. <laughs> Sorry. I also had similar satisfaction dragging Daniel Holbeck to the top of the list. He's a very nice guy. Yes. Where was Laura Chikoski? In the list. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Tell us, I oh, so knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> community manager Johnny Bacon is surveying, we've mentioned this, yep. Ubuntu members about the community, its strengths and weaknesses, and we'll put a link in the show notes. Okay. HP has chosen Ubuntu as the primary host and guest OS for its public cloud based on the OpenStack architecture. Cool. Okay, this is really interesting information for people who like clouds and stuff. So Mark, what's OpenStack? <laughs> I thought we deleted Thanks the OpenStack one. No, that we, was a we, different one. Oh, that yeah. was the other OpenStack. As I understand one. it, that was the more boring OpenStack one. is basically a way of someone setting up their own Amazon EC2-like system. Yeah, and it was Rackspace, I think. And Rackspace yeah. and NASA. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah use it. And Rackspace have, uh, have said they're going to uh, promise to offload it to the community rather than control <laughs> it internally. That's good. I old. mean, a... In a nice foundation, yeah. offload it in yeah, a nice. So they don't not have kick it out control. the car while it's at ninety miles an hour, like the veil. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. like that, yeah, yeah. Works, okay. Yeah. Well, it's really good news that Ubuntu is going to be the main yes. place for that, and Absolutely. apparently Canonical and HP are working together on that one. Yep. Cool. And not about Ubuntu, the OpenSUSE for ARM hardware project has launched a donation drive to raise funds, allowing them to buy ARM boards to be used for debugging. The target is to raise a princely 1,000 euros. Currently at two th- uh, 220 euros. Yeah. I think this That's is an excellent start. idea yeah. for them yeah. to buy some... Because one of the problems with ARM hardware is... Um, well, you need it to be able to compile your stuff for ARM hardware, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, they need some to be able to build OpenSUSE. It's one of those things where they have build farms, you know, they have ancient old servers of, of obscure architectures. Debian has them, that have yeah, done I think so. Yeah. For particular architectures living in a data centre somewhere, probably in a university uh, data centre. Um, oh, Good luck to them. Indeed, yes. I hope they make their £1,000. Euros. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, €1,000. What's that, about £10? <laughs> <laughs> and that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this week. <laughs> time for your feedback keith drummond friend of the show uh commented <laughs> everyone's a friend of my show oh did i say my whoops uh, <laughs> i'm thinking out loud again i think amy ferguson would disagree with <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh 
Uh, anyway, uh, edit that out. Uh, Keith Drummond commented on Google+. Plus. Just finished listening. Another great show. Thank you. But surprise nobody mentioned Deja Dupe, especially with it going default. I used back in time, but switched to Deja Dupe earlier this year. Maybe something for the next pre-1110 show? Oh! What's okay. It, what's you mean by going default? Is uh, it, it's there's in actually the default a, install. The, yeah. Seven years on, see. we've put a backup tool on the CD. Oh. Yeah, fancy that. There hmm. we go. So it's any good? Um, yes. I, I looked into it and it seems pretty good. It's yeah. what I use on my mum's machine, my mum Buntu machine. Uh, okay. She's got an external USB hard drive and Deja Jup just sits there and it uses, under the covers, it uses something called Duplicity, mm. uh-huh. which does the incremental kind of backup thing, leave it running and, you know. Oh, I might try that. It's, pre- it's pretty good, actually. It's worth a go. It's better than that one you tried previously, S Backup. Yeah, that especially so, because that one stops running now. <laughs> you have to actually manually start it to make it do the backup. <laughs> oh, dear. Mm. Keen Minecrafter Ian Bigcom Cuthbertson commented, Backing up, colon, RDIF back up from here to my parents' place, and my parents back up to here with RDIF back up. Recursive <laughs> problems there. Revision-based backups. Discs filled up really quick. <laughs> Revision-based backups mean you don't have to worry about keeping extra day, week, month, year versions. Alan, with your Dropbox woes, you could have restored the missing files via the web interface. Yeah, you weren't the only person to mention that, Ian. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's good when you're wrong because we've got lots of email. Had yes. I been here, I could have told him that. Because yes. I've just got a Dropbox Pro account. Have you really? Oh. Yes. Not Ubuntu One? Well, I was using Ubuntu One, but you can't, as far as I can work out, access the files from the web interface. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Well, I couldn't. <laughs> One.ubuntu.com to files. I couldn't find it. All it does is show you the directories that are synced. You can't click into them. Yeah, you can. Yeah. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> However, you can you. undelete files on Dropbox. <laughs> can someone please email in and point out that Laura is wrong? <laughs> yeah. Thank it doesn't you. matter. I've paid for a year now. <laughs> okay. You've got 12 months to email in. <laughs> <laughs> David Taylor emailed to say... Love the show. Thank, Thank you, you, David. I was, I was just listening <laughs> usually edit to your that chat out. on backups and felt you were a little unfair to Dropbox. Interestingly, Dropbox keeps provisions of files so you can roll back if you've been an idiot. Indeed. Can't be an idiot. I, I used to take care of my Android, use it to take care of my Android development files. If I accidentally delete or overwrite something, I can log into the website and download an older version. I hope Ubuntu One that works like this too, although I haven't looked into it. I couldn't like it. I'm sure I won't be the only one correcting you with this, so apologies if there were 1,000 to us. Uh, I found the discussion very interesting otherwise, smiley face. Oh, thank you. Yep. And so, everyone else. Yep. <laughs> uh, no, Ubuntu One doesn't have revisions. No. No. It just has the current version on the website Which that is... you can find via onebuntucom slash files. <laughs> yes. Which yeah. is specifically what I was looking for. Yes. <clears throat> Christian Frisk on Facebook said, "Heard about your last heard your last podcast in which you discussed about different backup solutions. Do you know about Backup 2L? It's what Bitemark Code at UK use by default, so that's why I learned it. But now, I certainly don't regret it. It's my default for backing up almost everything nowadays. Backup 2L. What's the L? It's just a lowercase L. Yeah, but what does the <laughs> L mean? Usually two. Number two. Think, well, it says it's a lightweight Long. or low maintenance tool. So oh, maybe so it's backup two, the lightweight version, not backup two back up. L thing that begins with L. <laughs> no, it's backup two, the number two L. Right, the letter L. Yeah, I was trying to deconstruct that and find out what that meant. Yeah, I haven't done enough I'm research. Not like Googling. PDF to text, if that I think that's yeah, what that's what. Yes, at. that's what I thought. Yes, See, I haven't done enough research to not find an idiot, out why that what is. That man said <laughs> it's it's a great command line tool that has screenshots, which are just terminal. <laughs> Excellent. I, get, um, yeah. oh, I know exactly, but oh. it's always amusing. Um, it kind of proves it. Yeah. And finally, a little something from the Wing Commander. Uh oh. Commander, Sir Arthur Curmudgeon here. Heard your last show whilst sipping my gin and tonic in the drawing room. You were talking about things that get your back up. Newspaper delivery boys, plastic milk bottles, Piers Morgan. Bah, if I start on all the topics that get my back up, well, your show's just not long enough. Like electronic voting. How am I supposed to go into the voting booth 
and spoil my paper if all I've got to vote with is a mouse button. You know, writing none of the above, or fake candidates' names, or just plain drawing a big dangler on the ballot paper. A hanging chad, I believe they call it. Don't get me started, as my nephew says. The other thing in the show was the reference to losing your cat in an horrific clipboard accident. Well, blow me down. I didn't realize it was that common a problem. You should do what I did and give the old moggy a decent send-off. I toasted mine. I mean, any excuse for a gin and tonic, eh? Cheers, bottoms up, as they say in the rugby. Yours, the WC. Uh. I think he needs less gin or maybe more. (laughs) I think Alan's leaking from his face. (laughs) Oh, dear. Uh, that was one of the best ones for a while, I think, on the Wing Commander I front. Think, I yes. enjoyed that one. Hmm, me and, too. And that's all of your feedback. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thought about Ubuntu and the community around it, especially prescient given the conversation we had earlier in the show. Yeah, we wrote that for a reason, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So join us on Tuesday the 25th of October for our next live episode. Have you had fun, everybody? Yes. 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 Is it time for cake? Yes. Yes. What cake have we got? Uh, we Laura? have fiendish fancies. Are they like French really? fancies, but scary. The Halloween. Are they chilly? Oh, okay. I don't know why they're scary, apart from when somebody throws them at you across the room. <laughs> it could be arranged. Incoming. Yeah. So let's get the Halloween. Let's get the kettle on. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.